morning, church. Morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I will happily hear it again. <laughs> that was just a, a tremendous blessing. Thank you so much. That was, a, that was a beautiful song, beautiful testimony and music. How is everybody this morning? It's nice to see your smiling faces. Our kind Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, this is your house, this is your day, these are your people. Lord, we come to worship you. Lord, we pray that you will be in this place, that your Holy Spirit will be here, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. Lord, be with my lips. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, help me not to stand in the way of these important thoughts and truths. In Jesus' name. I'm going to speak from down here today, if that's all right with you. No objections. I was on my way here this morning, and driving along, raining slightly. You know what it is? You're trying to beat traffic, going in and out, and uh, you know, thinking about what I'm going to say. And all of a sudden, coming in the opposite direction, there's a car, a truck actually. And uh, he's flashing his lights at me, and all other oncoming tra uh, traffic is flashing his lights. Now, I did it three or four times, and I flashed him back. And uh, I know what he's trying to communicate. I know the secret. I know the sign. Up ahead, there's a tax collector. <clears throat> One of Volusia County's finest. And uh, I can't see him, but a fellow motorist has given me the sign. And uh, I would be a fool to continue on at the rate that I was going. And recognizing signs is a wise person's purview. It's important to recognize the signs. Because they're there all around us. Some people don't know what that means. And they go headlong into the radar trap and then they get pulled over. It happens all the time. Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And you can turn with me in your Bibles there. We frantically reformatted these slides to get to the screen. Thank you so much, Marty and Deborah, for making is possible. Um, the format that I sent this in, the words would have been on the left and the right, you wouldn't have been able to see them. These are the words of Jesus. He departed, went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? The disciples came to Jesus and they said, They said, Do you see how beautiful this temple is? Do you see how big the stones are? Do you see how perfectly they fit together? And we are told that a section of the wall from the time of Solomon had survived. Signs. It's important to recognize the signs. A section of the wall from the time of Solomon had survived, and the stones were so massive, they were fitted together with almost unbelievable precision, so that you could not slide a piece of paper in between the massive, massive monolithic stones. And the disciples were so impressed and so proud of the architecture, and they called Jesus' attention to it. They said, do you see these stones? I mean, look at how amazing this engineering is. Look at this architecture. And Jesus said, do you see these stones? You think these are so great? He said, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another, another that shall not be thrown down. And they were like, whoa. That's not what we thought he was going to say. That really sort of took them aback, I'm sure. And they came to him when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives later. 
And they said this to him. They said, tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world. Now how many questions are there there? That's right. When the, shall these things be? I.e., when shall the temple be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now they figured that those two things were the same thing. You know, because if the temple was overthrown and the, and the wall was broken down, surely that had to be the end of the world. And Jesus, in his graciousness, did not overwhelm them with information. But he answered both questions. When you read Matthew 20, uh, 24, you have to read that in mind, that they asked two questions, and Jesus answered two questions. And so he gives them a double prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he gives them a prophecy about the end of the world. Now, Jesus begins his answer by saying, Take heed that nobody deceive you. Now, I'm not going to read all of Matthew chapter 24 today, but I want to walk you through a number of the conditions that existed at the time of Jesus' first advent, the coming of the Messiah. These are all taken from Desire of Ages. And uh, they're formatted to fit this screen, as they say. All right. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. Mm -hmm. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Those who first receded died without the sight. Meaning that those who had first believed about the coming of the Messiah, they didn't live to see him. From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away, the voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel. And many were ready to explain, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. So I want you, as we go through these quotes, try and keep a track, tabulate. Try and keep track and tabulate the factors that existed before Jesus came. Marty, what did I do? It's feedback from that mic. Okay, stand that. over here closer. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right, so you'll notice, let's just gather them up in our minds and we'll go through some of them at the end. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know what? No haste and no delay. He's never early and he's never late. Amen. Though through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, this is God's vision to Abraham. God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel in Egypt and had declared that the time of their sojourning should be 400 years. Afterward, he said, shall they come out with great substance. Genesis 15, 14. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled in vain. On the selfsame day appointed in the divine promise, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt, Exodus 12, 41. There was an appointed time. The prophecy had been that they would be in Egypt for 400 years. And when the day came for them to leave, when Moses was called to the burning bush, and Israel was enslaved in Egypt, the last thing that you would have thought is that a few sh short months later, Israel was going to march out of Egypt because they were enslaved so thoroughly with rigorous bondage, 
Pharaoh had control of them, and circumstances for all intents and purposes appeared that they would never change. That they would never change, that they would never be free. And yet, a few short months later, they were free. Because the time came for their deliverance. So in heaven's counsel, the hour for the coming of Christ had been determined. You'll notice that it was preset. That the prophecies of Daniel had shown when the Messiah would come. When the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The reference to the great clock of time is interesting, don't you think? You can't see it, but there's a schedule. There is an appointed time. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. Providence had directed the movements of nations. And the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. How was the world ripe? Let's continue. The nations were united under one government. One language was widely spoken. And everywhere was recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feasts. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. This is an interesting one. The dying words of Jacob. They were read this morning for Sabbath school by Donovan. Elder Donovan. Filled them with hope. Now this, it didn't fill everybody with hope. But there were people who were looking for the Messiah to come back. And for those people who were looking, they looked back to Jacob's prophecy about the Messiah and it filled them with hope. What did Jacob say? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh come. They looked at this and they saw that the waning power of Israel testified that the Messiah's coming was at hand. I want you to just think about those words. They knew that the Messiah was coming because Jacob had said, That before power left Israel, before self-governance left Israel, that a lawgiver would, would always be there until Shiloh came. Shiloh was a word for the Messiah. Mm. And so they knew that because Israel was getting weaker and weaker and weaker, that the time was near. Isn't that interesting? The prophecy of Daniel pictured the glory of his reign over an empire which should succeed all earthly kingdoms and said the prophet, it shall stand forever. Daniel 2.44 While few understood the nature of Christ's mission, there was a widespread expectation of a mighty prince who should establish his kingdom in Israel and who should come as a deliverer to the nations. Such were the circumstances when Christ first came. Let's sum up. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent. The time seemed delayed. People were ready to say every prophecy has failed. The centuries had passed and the voices of the prophets ceased. Meaning that there was no more prophet in Israel. For some time, for some centuries. The prophets had all written. They had come. They had gone. They had died. Their words remained, their prophecies remained, but there was no prophet left. One great world power existed, one world government, the Roman power, was the power. One common language existed, that was the Roman language, or Latin. 
The hand of the oppressor was heavy on God's people. Meaning the, the yoke of the Roman Empire was strong on Israel. Wickedness and depravity had dramatically increased. And when the great clock of time pointed to that hour, Jesus was born. I would propose to you that you could take this list and match it to our current state of events. Not only that you could match it, but that it's significant. The time seemed delayed. People were ready to say every prophecy has failed. How many people on the street today are waiting for the advent, the second advent of the Messiah? Is that something people are anticipating much these days? Or a rapture. Or a secret rapture, right? They misinterpreted the prophecies. Amen. The centuries had passed and the voices of the prophets had ceased. One great world power, one government, centralized authority, Increasingly, authority is being centralized in one power. There is one world power in, in the world. It is the United States. That is the world's last standing superpower. But there is a, an increasing push towards centralization of authority. With the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, one world government. Power <laughs> over a centralized response to pandemics. Power to override the laws of a land in the interests of the common good. These are the circumstances in our world today. The hand of the oppressor was heavy on God's people. Now I propose to you that in this land of liberty, still there is freedom. But I can tell you, there are many, many places in this world where to be a Christian is a death sentence if you are caught. Converting from the religion, the state religion, is punishable by death. To become a Seventh-day Adventist is even worse. There are churches meeting around the world in basements and in people's homes because you are not allowed to gather. And then we have the oppression of the civil powers with respect to liberty of conscience and the recent overthrows of constitutional rights and freedoms. Wickedness and depravity have dramatically increased. Right now, there are people on the freeway in Los Angeles who have blocked the highway. Some of them have covered their faces and their hands in blood. There are thousands of them out there gathering in the major cities of the United States protesting the loss of the ability to kill unborn children. You cannot open the news without seeing deeds of... You think that it was bad in, in the Pioneer's Day. Mrs. White wrote about the newspapers and how they're full of deeds of violence. She hadn't seen anything yet, at least not in the actual, the actual time that she was. The earth today is full of violence. There are murders and rapes and acts of domestic violence and terrorism and just, just a recitation of it turns the blood cold, just to see it. Children spend all day long playing violent video games. They're out on summer break. They spend all day long inside the house shooting each other, casting spells on each other, fighting mystical creatures. I won't tell you the rest of what they do online. Well, I'll, maybe I'll mention this. In the metaverse, which is supposed to be this new online utopia, right? Facebook has changed its name to Meta. You can buy one of these ocular uh, headsets the Oculus, you go online, you walk around, you know, they want this to be the new reality. You'll sit in a corner with your headset on and sort of drool on yourself and you'll live in this alternate reality. This is the new utopia. 
a woman created an avatar, which is your alternate. She went on Meta. Within 15 minutes, she was gang raped by a multitude, a multitude of people. Now, in virtual reality, not in reality, that's a crime. But in the metaverse, everything goes. This is the world that we live in. The earth is full of violence and iniquity. This list seems awfully pertinent to our day. I skipped this first one. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent. The prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 reveals the exact, specific time that the Messiah was to be born. Right down to the very week. Right there. And the people of the East they had the prophecies of Daniel because they had been circulated in, ba in Babylon where Daniel was a captive. And they were looking at these prophecies and they knew that the time for the Messiah to be born had come. So they traveled to Israel. Traveled a long ways. It was weeks and weeks and weeks, probably months to get there. And they got there, and they came into the city, and they knew the time had come, and they were shocked, because nobody was getting ready for him to show up. The city was not preparing, the priests were not preparing, the king was not preparing, and they said, where is he that is to be born king of the Jews? Because we came to find him, because the prophecies clearly foretell that this is the time. And they were like, people were like, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? There's no king of the Jews here. There's no Messiah coming. Like, have you lost your mind? The Spirit of Prophecy says that they were met with not a little bit of scorn. Like, who do you, what, what have you guys, what do you smoke over in your country that's led you six months' journey to the land of Israel? You're totally wrong. But Jesus' birth occurred on schedule nevertheless. Amen. That is something brothers and sisters. Do you know the Bible says, I know there's lunch back there, and uh, 1230. 1230. Okay, 1230 is okay. Yes. Right. Throw, throw something at me if you get hungry. Sandwich, preferably. <laughs> the Bible says, Amos chapter 3, 7, that the Lord does nothing except he reveals his, his secrets to the prophets. Amos 3, 7. Or his counsel to the prophets. Amen. If he reveals it, now, I, there are all these parallels, all these stories in the Bible about how suddenly things change dramatically. Okay? The nation of Israel coming out of Egypt is only one of those instances. On the self-same day where it was appointed, the armies of Jehovah marched out of Egypt. Pharaoh could not hold them back. He could not keep them in bondage. The time had come, and they were delivered. Yes. But there are other stories. When Belshazzar held his big party, and Babylon was secure. There was an army outside, and Belshazzar said, let them stay out there. They can stay out there for 20 years, as, as far as I care. We're having a party in here. And he did not know that the river had been diverted, and Cyrus was able to march his armies underneath the gate the empty, well, I don't know, it was entirely empty, but they had drained the Euphrates River enough to march underneath the wall and into the city and overthrow it in one night. One night. For all intents and purposes, you would have thought that that city would never fall. God came to Noah. Open your
your Bibles with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter... The earth was becoming well populated. Verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man, for that he shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. A hundred and twenty years. Go down to um, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Was only evil continually. I want you to think about all those millions of people in this country right now who are protesting the loss of their constant, what they thought was a constitutional right to kill a human being in the womb. Now that's only one example. Right now, right now they are carrying on outside the steps of the Supreme Court, chanting, covered in blood, screaming and yelling, because they are angry. Thoughts of their heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. But God looked upon the earth, verse 12, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. There it is again. It is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them from the earth. And then he tells Noah to build an ark. You guys can't hear me. Okay. No. <laughs> they just died. <clears throat> All right. Oh. 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 What's that? Yeah. Oh, maybe you should just go back over to the end so you're not by the mic. But the thing is, is that. Well, maybe not. Uh, Okay, let's just keep going because it's working now. All right. He's got one. This is number two. Testing, 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 testing. Number two. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. That happens a lot to me. The technology doesn't like me. <laughs> All right. Now, when God said that there was going to be a flood, that sounded like absolute crazy talk because there had never been a flood. And Noah started building this ark. There's never been rain. There's never been rain. And Noah started building this massive structure. You know, I've watched Pastor Ricky build stuff from time to time. You know, and he's methodical, and he builds, he shows up every day, he builds, he hammers, he nails, and eventually it's done. Noah did that for 120 years. You talk about a project. The Bible says in 2 Peter verse 2, ver, uh, 2 5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness. And I can tell you right now, he didn't just preach up front on Sabbath and talk about righteousness. He preached righteousness by building an ark. And 
He condemned the world, according to Hebrews chapter 11. 